Today's guest was trained in classical marketing with his Wharton MBA and experience with Campbell's Soup and top-level consulting firms. He summarizes years of experience into a very valuable 30-minute interview. I encourage you to listen all the way through as this interview is packed with advice you can apply to your product launch today. Welcome to another episode of the Harvest Growth Podcast, focused on helping consumer product companies inventors and entrepreneurs harvest the growth potential of their product businesses. Today, I'm really excited to be speaking with Ben Nepler, who's the co-founder of trueplaces.com and the co-inventor of their first product they brought to market, which is called the Emmett Chair, which I'm really excited to share with our audience. Uh, For those of you who are listening and don't have the ability to see visuals, um, we'll obviously describe this and you'll get to sense of it. But I do encourage people to go visit their website and see the cool technology that they put into portable chairs. It's a really cool product uh, called, again, trueplaces.com. You'll see it in the show notes as well if you're driving and forget to write this down. Uh, but please go check it out when you have the chance. In the meantime, I want to jump into our conversation. Ben, first of all, thanks so much for joining our show today. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure. You know, you and I met on LinkedIn and we, we share some kind of background, right? Where we came into this consumer product marketing space, uh, both be at what I would call classically trained, right? At, at uh, MBA, getting an MBA, right? And then kind of getting out in the, in the CPG world before now you jumping on your own and launching this product, the Emmett Chair and, and, and founding this company, trueplaces.com. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and what brought you here today? Yeah, absolutely. I, I spent most of my career in, in various forms of, of consulting, um, originally management consulting, so traditional strategy, business strategy. Um, I, I, I did my MBA, as you said, um, and then following that, I spent a few years on the client side in kind of classic consumer packaged goods, um, where you really get, get, get that traditional training, as, as you say. Um, after that, I, uh, I spent a few years back in consulting, but really focused on, on brand and marketing strategy. Um, and then I, I, a couple of years ago, jumped uh, into starting True Places. So it's been a, a, real, a, a real journey. Um, I met my, my co-founder. We worked together at, uh, we were working at Campbell Soup Company. Um, my co-founder was there for almost 15 years. So he really comes from that, that traditional traditional background, but we worked together in the, in the innovation team, uh, there and, uh, in brand management and marketing. And I think I mentioned to you as we were going back and forth with our, with our messages that, uh, we share, I, we sent a few of our people that kind of maybe well, you could say they upgraded, right. But I worked at Kraft Abisco and they left that to go work at Campbell soup and I've kept in touch with them and really enjoyed their experience there too. So it's yes, yeah, certainly a great company where you learn a lot and, and it gives you a good footing, I think, to now work in a different world. You know, what have you found so far where obviously marketing, marketing cans of soup in your case, or, you know, crackers and cookies in my case over at Nabisco, it's not the same thing as marketing direct to consumer, but it's a great training ground. So what would you say is, has helped you from that past classic marketing experience that's really helped you to propel your career on the direct to consumer side? Yeah, I think there are a, a couple of things. Um, w- one is just the real, like relentless focus on the consumer. So, you know, I think when when you go through that that traditional training, um, that's what you're really taught from the from the first day is that it's it's all about the consumer, understanding their life, understanding how what you're offering can fit into that, understanding the consumer needs and what the opportunities might be be around that for the business. And so I, I think that's something that um, is very different often to you know, if, if someone in, invents a product themselves, they, they can often be really excited about the technology and about the product and almost forget about, well, what are, is there a market for it? Um, it is it really fulfilling a, a consumer need? And is, what, what are the pain points around that that you're addressing? So I think that's probably the biggest um, uh, kind of learning from that training that I've, I feel like we've really been able to bring to, to true places. Um, it, it, outside of that, but obviously, as you know, like the context is so different. Marketing a, a brand or a product in the context of a, 
a very large, I mean, extremely large, um, you know, traditional corporate environment is, is just very different to starting something from scratch, uh, trying to get a new business or a new brand off the ground where you're starting from like no awareness, no one knows anything about you. you you're literally starting from a blank slate. So it's been a, a very interesting experience for, for myself and for my, my co-founder uh, going from that, that large corporate environment and all of the structures and organization that you have there, as well as resources, and going to basically having nothing, none of that. But, um, you know, we're able to be a lot more adaptable and a lot more flexible um, and really move much more quickly than we would have been able to in a, in a large environment. Yeah, that's a good point. I think it's the one big difference is that speed and the ability to learn. But I couldn't agree with you more, I think, on that, the need to really focus on the consumer first that is oftentimes lost with new inventors or product marketers that have a great idea and concept and just decide, hey, let me bring this out into the world on my own. Uh, focusing first on, it's almost like the difference between features and benefits, right? So, mm -hmm. so often inventors are very engineering minded and they focus on the features, what your product does, right? And they are really cool and different. But if you don't get the consumer benefits, like why the consumer should care about this, it gets lost on them, right? They don't care about features. They care about how your product is going to help them. So and I think it's a good segue. Let's, let's jump in and, and talk about your actual product. So the, the Emmett chair, can you, let's give a description for the audience that may not have heard of it yet. Yeah. So uh, let me take a, even just a step back from that and just give a little bit of context about true places as a, as a whole because the, the Emmet is our, our first product, our first chair. Uh, but really the, the reason that we started the company uh, True Places was to better address a, a whole aspect of our lives that we felt um, like most brands or, or products weren't really uh, addressing in a relevant way before. So we realized that we just spent a huge amount of our time outside but not necessarily in the great outdoors of going on a huge camping trip, but often in these situations like hanging out with neighbors and friends in the backyard or the front yard, going to block parties, on the sidelines of kids' sports games, uh, concerts in the park, all of these types of situations that are, that are outside, but not necessarily that far from home. And what we were realizing was a lot of the things that we were using and taking with us weren't really designed for those occasions um, in particular and the kind of most obvious pain point literally <laughs> is that people are sitting there for hours and hours and they're mostly sitting on low quality camping chairs uh, which don't really fit with how meaningful these moments are like it's it's important time with friends and family um, and it also doesn't necessarily fit with the quality that you expect in the rest of your of our lives. Um, and so we we felt like there was this uh, this opportunity to create a much more comfortable chair, a much higher quality, um, much uh, much better designed for the way that people are actually living and, and using these products in their lives. So that's what we set out to do. And the result of that is the uh, the, the Emmett chair. Uh, we spent the last uh, 18 months really working through design and engineering and, and the production side of things. Uh, it turns out that folding chairs are actually not as, as simple as you might think. Uh, there's a lot of engineering behind it. And uh, I think we quickly realized maybe why this hadn't been attempted before. Um, uh, and so, you know, it spent, we spent a lot of time working through that but really the what we were trying to do was create something that is much more comfortable um, much better designed with higher quality materials but also with other features that we that we know people people want so you know we have bottle openers under each arm we have cup holder and a phone holder that can go on either side we have hooks for the for the carrying bag um, and we tried to bring all of that from a much more modern perspective. So, you know, the, the carrying bag is, is really upgraded. It, 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 it's much more comfortable, uh, has, a, has a padded strap. Uh, we use recycled 
material for that. So the carrying bags made of recycled plastic bottles. Uh, we know that that's something that people increasingly care about. Um, but fundamentally, the what we were trying to do was create a really comfortable chair that you could also take with you. Um, and so a, a lot of the design process is really coming from the perspective of how do we create a piece of furniture, like a, a really nice chair that you can also fold up and is really lightweight and you can take with you, as opposed to how do we create something that's, that folds up that you can also kind of sit on, <laughs> which is how most of the portable chairs and the, the camping chairs that people use, um, that, that's how they were really designed. Um, and in that category, there's just been a, a, a significant race to the bottom in terms of pulling out as much cost as possible at the expense of any kind of quality. And that's really been happening for for a couple of decades, and there, there hadn't been much innovation in this space. Uh, to the extent that there had been, it was either trying to make chairs that are incredibly ultra lightweight. So you you end up with a, a one or two pound hiking chair that you can put in your backpack. And that's, you know, that's that's fantastic when you're walking long distances, but they're not that's not very comfortable. And that doesn't really serve the uh, the, the use cases that we're looking looking out for, um, or there's there's been innovation in you know patio furniture where it's very comfortable, uh, but you can't take that with you. You can't move that around. So we really tried to to, to marry those two together. And you know you, you look at your price point and it's significantly higher than the Walmart portable chairs, right? Mm-hmm. That you bring with you, and I think there's there's a positive side of that for sure. You know, you don't, you don't, once you start competing on price, you end up being like everybody else. And I I love how you've already talked about how you started with consumer need first, right? And let's get this right, get the quality there. And then from that point, how did you determine your your price point? So, I mean, obviously, you know, everybody knows from a finance perspective, we got to make sure our margins work, et cetera. But I know with your training and your background, you've come into this with, okay, we want to make sure it's the right price point for the consumers. And, you know, margins aside, it could be much higher margin or, or whatever. How do you decide on the final price point you ended up with? Yeah. So, you know, a, a lot of it was, was consumer insight and then design design led. Like we, we did a lot of research with, with consumers up front before we, before we started designing anything, we knew what we wanted to get to. And we knew that the, by far the most important factor was, was comfort. Um, and, uh, we went through the design process uh, with all of that in mind. And we said to ourselves, we, we need to uh, kind of fulfill these, these consumer needs around comfort, around portability, around these other features that people, people want, around sustainability. And we're going to create the best product that really addresses these needs. Um, if someone wants you know the the cheapest option available then this probably isn't going to be be right for them so i think the, the the first thing was really starting from that that consumer perspective i think the the, the second aspect to it is um around the, the 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 frame the framing and the and the positioning so an, another you know aspect that you you learn learn in business school or or learn in the traditional uh, uh consumer consumer companies. Um, the, the way that we present the product um, and the way that we talk about it and the context around it is obviously hugely important. So, you know, if we, if we just line up our chair against, you know, the Walmart camping chair and just, you know, show that to people, we're just going to look like a really expensive version of what they already know. Um, if we compare ourselves, for example, to, to patio furniture, then all of a sudden you're in a completely different, uh, different frame of reference. Um, people, the, the price points and the, the, the context in, in which people use those, those products is very different. Um, and so already with, with even just that, that decision around, you know, how we, how we frame, frame ourselves. Like those kinds of things can can make a, a big difference, um, and you know the, the final point I think is, as you know, you know price is one 
w- one aspect of the of you know what classically they'd call the marketing mix right the the product and the price and the and the distribution and then the the communication around it um all of those things need to need to work in unison together and make sense together so you know in everything that we do we're not trying to compete directly against the walmart camping chair like that's that's a great option for people that are looking for you know something that that you can you can take with you that you can sit on and your main you know concern is is price uh we're trying to compete in a in a slightly different space yeah absolutely know your know your customer and it you know in summary it, it guides you towards the right price the right features that need to be included in that as well i think very well said. So we're going to discuss how you raised over $160,000 on Kickstarter to get the business off the ground. But first, I want to share a message from one of our partners, Shopify. So there's a reason that over 1.7 million e-commerce businesses trust Shopify to handle everything from marketing and payments to secure checkout and shipping. At, At Harvest Growth, dozens of our clients find that Shopify is the best platform to connect with marketing channels like Facebook or Instagram. And we've seen conversion rates more than double when transitioning to the Shopify platform. For a limited time, we can help you get your first month free, a savings of up to $79. If you reach out to Shopify at harvestgrowth.com to learn more. So Ben, I wanna talk about uh, your, your Kickstarter success. It's, it's great to see it and it's not easy. You know, I, I think a lot of people that haven't been down that road of crowdfunding before, they don't realize that it's not just about having a good product. Now that's, of course, you've gotta have that, right? But there's so much more that goes into that, that window of success, which is so limited in crowdfunding. I think you mentioned yours was 30 days, right? Is that how long your campaign was? Yeah. So, you know, any other marketing campaign outside of crowdfunding, You try, test, fail, learn, improve, and you've got time to do that. There's no end. But in Kickstarter, you've got that short window. Everything has to come in. It has to get everything dialed in to to work. And you guys did so very successfully. So again, raising $160,000 in 30 days, which kickstarted or, you know, really crowdfunded your business to get it off the ground in the first place. Can you talk a little bit about what helped you guys to be successful? Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're, you're right. It is, it is a little bit of its own world, right? The, uh, the product crowdfunding space, uh, whether it's Kickstarter or Indiegogo or, or, or others. Um, yeah, it, it was something that we, that we planned, that that we planned for, for a a decent amount of time. Um, we felt quite a lot of pressure with it. As you said, it's, it's 30, yeah, the campaigns are typically 30 to, to 60 days. So it's a really short window. Um, there are, uh, at this point, a lot of best practices around uh, doing a, a Kickstarter campaign. Um, you can find a, a lot of information online um, and you can also find uh, experts who really focus, like that's all they do. Uh, so we, 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 did, uh, we did get some additional uh, kind of expertise for that because we, we felt a lot of pressures. You know, we, we, we can't afford to learn our way into it um, in the way that you, you normally would. Um, I, I think it, it is an interesting opportunity, though, for, for, for new, new brands, new companies, new, new products uh, to, to be able to get a little bit of a start in the market. Um, first of all, you're able to do it well ahead of when you're actually going to be shipping the product so that is a huge benefit from a business perspective to and, and just from a cash flow uh, perspective uh, to be able to to show a little bit of market demand you know six or nine months before you're actually really in market so that that's huge secondly there is an existing uh, community of people who are uh, interested in in supporting new innovation and new products and are excited about being like on the cutting edge of that being the first ones to uh, to, to be able to get in, involved with that um, ha- having said all of that um, w- we I think treated it correctly as a way to gain pre-sales um, rather than like a, a, a traditional, funding 
method. So it, it, it's maybe not like the ideal way to really fund the business, but it's a fantastic way uh, to, to gain pre-sales. And we, we treated it like we were launching the product, right? So um, as much as the, the actual campaign is important, even more important than that is the pre-launch campaign. Uh, how do you get people excited um, before you actually launch on, on Kickstarter? Uh, one of the things that uh, quickly became apparent when we started doing research around it was you, you really need people to back your campaign on the first couple of days. Um, without that momentum, it's uh, it, it's very difficult to to be successful. So in order to 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 have people backing it on the first couple of days, you really need to do some kind of pre-launch marketing, right? To to build a little bit of a community. Um, I think this is why you see many of the most successful crowdfunding campaigns are coming from companies or people that have done it before. So they already have an existing customer base. They already have an existing community that they actually bring to the to the campaign. And then beyond that, I think you know it's it's a little bit of a not dirty secret in that world, but the reality is now um, you need to drive traffic to that campaign. And so the the I, I think maybe ten years ago when Kickstarter first started, it, it was a little bit different. Um, you could throw an idea up there, and if people liked it, then they might then they might fund it. The reality now is that there are so many projects on there. There's so much going on. Um, most people are not going to see what you're doing. Um, and so this, I, I, I think the, the most dangerous thing in probably in all of marketing, but even more so in it, with something like Kickstarter is the idea that, you know, if, if I build it, they will come, right? So um, trying to do something that you think is really cool, and it may be fantastic from a product perspective, but if no one sees it and no one knows that it's there, then you don't have a chance. And so the the reality is that you need to have other marketing efforts whether it's social media ads um or other other efforts that are driving potential backers to your campaign absolutely that's great great uh, way to summarize the success on that platform it can be so complex but i think you've done a good job explaining the, the key metrics and every campaign is going to be a little bit different of course but but there are uh, there is a path really to follow that's going to be more likely to drive you towards that success. So now that you've you've gotten past that pre-sale approach, what's next for your business? Great, great question. So we've spent the last uh, nine months really working through manufacturing and and production. Obviously, I'm sure many of your listeners are in a similar position. Like no one, no one had global pandemic in their business plan, right? So, uh, from a supply perspective, from a supply chain and production, it's been a, an enormous challenge. Um, but we we've just uh, we're just emerging from that, and we have, you know, our first production run completed. So we're we're in the process. Uh, right now of, of actually launching the business for for real uh, so we're we're just sending out the first units to all of our pre-sales backers which is incredibly exciting and we we can't wait to get it get get the chair in, into their hands um, and to to get additional feedback from from them um, and we just made our our, our website live at, at trueplaces.com so we're going to be selling direct to, to consumer through there. Um, and so, you know, for us, uh, it, it's, we're dealing also with some potential seasonality in the market, right? We're, we're dealing with out, outdoor products. Um, and so we're really, we've been desperate to get into market um, these, this, this past year. We're finally doing that right now. Um, we're, we're launching, it's, you know, September September now, uh, we hope that we'll we'll be able to do as as much as we can in terms of sales over the next couple of months, and then really set ourselves up for an even bigger push when it comes to the spring of next year. Perfect. Well, Ben, this has been a great interview. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, it's a, like I, like I've told the audience, great product, 
encourage everyone to check out the website, trueplaces.com to learn more, at least check it out. Even if you know, you're not in the market for a portable chair, see the great work that they've done. And you can even look up their past uh, Kickstarter campaign if you want to see that page and just see some of the, the great work uh, over these past uh, couple of years. Ben, is there anything I didn't ask you that you think could be helpful for our audience? Uh, I don't think so. Th th this has been great. You know, one of the, I, I think the only thing I would, I would add just from a, you know, marketing perspective is um, one of the both opportunities and challenges that, that we see for, for us, and I'm sure many others are, are facing a similar thing is, is that we're, we're almost creating a little bit of a new category. Um, the, the, the category that we're focused on this idea of, of like just outside your door and the, and the modern outdoors that's somewhere between just being at home, like, you know, home and garden and on, on one side and on the other side, uh, going on a big trip and, and camping, like th th that whole category is for many people, a huge aspect of, of our lives. We spend hours and hours every week and it's not very well defined. And, you know, I think for us, we see that as a huge opportunity it's also a challenge from a marketing perspective when you're when, when you're just starting and 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 just starting the business. Um, so you know, I think that's something that a lot of businesses can can think about um, and and grapple with. Um, for us, it's been an it's been a really interesting experience. It's it's a great insight and really a good thing to think about. As you know, no matter what category or type of product you're thinking about as an inventor or entrepreneur but looking for that hole in the marketplace. And I think what you've identified is a, it's now seems obvious, right? I hadn't thought of that before, but it really is. It's like, okay, you've either got your back door permanent seating or camping, crappy, lightweight, but easy to take with you, right? But there is that, that place in the middle, which is so much bigger, right? Going to soccer games, going hanging out with your neighbors. You know, we all have, if, you know, I shouldn't say all of us, but a lot of us, you know, if we're outdoorsy, we camp, we have those things, but it's a couple or a few times a year, but you're enjoying outdoor space. It could be dozens of times, right? So it's it's a big open space. I think that you guys are taking advantage of. That's great advice for other marketers to look for those opportunities, right? Where, where other marketers aren't seeing them. So kudos to you guys for, for figuring that out. And it's uh, I think it's a fantastic insight. I do want to encourage your audience, if you'd like to learn more about what we call the perfect launch process for marketing products, check out harvestgrowth.com. And if you still have questions on how you can implement this process for your business, you'll see a link on our homepage to set up a free consultation with one of our product launch specialists. But I do encourage everyone also to please check out trueplaces.com. Uh, check out the Emmett folding chair and, and more products to come on the way with Ben and his team as well. Uh, again, Ben, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks so much for having me.